So, hi friends, as a part of this fiscal development theme itself, economic survey in its second chapter has given some other information also. This information is very relevant to the session that we have already discussed called pandemic years and the prudent fiscal development. Why this, why this information is so relevant means this information will provide some sort of the policy decisions that are taken by the government. So, I want to deal these things in a separately that is why I have taken this. But if you looking into the economic survey, one thing you have to be very careful is whenever you find the boxes in economic survey, please try to have a look into that boxes. Normally, economic survey gives some extra information by place it in the boxes. You will say box 1, box 2, box 3, box 4 and the information inside the box is very, very important. Sometimes you may get a mains questions from that. So, the information in the boxes are very, very important. Now, I am going to discuss some of the information mentioned in the boxes of chapter 2 that is fiscal development, fiscal development. Only few aspects you are aware and you know that, but still I want to just uh, give a little reputation to you, so that you can revise it. The first thing is, it is completely a boxes information that I am giving. The first one is, with respect to this privatization and disinvestment, privatization and disinvestment, privatization or disinvestment. Because during this pandemic, when we have taken a long term measures, apart from the short term measures, we have changed the policy stance. That means, it is not a new policy, but it is a continuation to the existing policy, but with a much more vigor. So, one among them is this privatization or disinvestment policy. We have completely used the term called privatization. We have completely used the term called privatization or you can call it as a new public sector enterprise policy. Now, here economic survey has given a detailed analysis of evolution of the disinvestment policy of government of India. So, evolution of the disinvestment policy of government of India, they have given in the box, just have a look into that, just have a look into that. Now, I will try to give some points with respect to the evolution of disinvestment policy of government of India. See, the first one is, in the year 1951, we have amended our constitution, that is the first constitution amendment, first constitution amendment. And in the first constitution amendment, we have put some restrictions to the fundamental right. We have added many restrictions to the many fundamental right, but one restriction to the one fundamental right is very important for our for our topic that right is article 19 1g article 19 1g so what is this fundamental right this fundamental right is the citizens have a right to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation trade or business that means as a citizen you can carry any profession, any occupation, you can do any trade, you can do any business. You have a complete right, you have a complete choice. But in the year 1951, what we have done is, in the interest of the public or in the interest of the state, the state can impose, the state can impose some restriction on this fundamental right. That means, in the interest of the general public, the state can put some restriction on your 191G right. That means, the state can stop you in a particular business. 
the state cannot allow you to do a particular trade. The state may not allow you to start a particular industry. That means in the interest of larger public, you can do that. So that itself is the starting point to this socialism or the state-led economy in our country. It cannot be completely called as a socialism, but to that direction, a state-led economy has started. But if you looking into our constitution, did really our constitution says that the state must only uh, start the business and also it, it should not allow private people? No, the state-led economy is not mentioned in the constitution, but in, not in the original constitution. But later we have amended, later we have amended and we said like this business we are not supposed to take, it is the state will take in the larger interest we have done. And if you want to move to the capitalistic, simply if you remove this restriction, then we can do anything. Then we can do anything. So, the state-led economy or private economy is not mentioned in the constitution. But later through an amendments, we have brought some changes to the constitution so that we have brought this. So that we have brought this a state-led economy in the year 1951. And after that, after that, you know industrial policy resolutions and you have studied how each and every industrial resolution policy from 1956 to 1973 to 1977 to 1980 to 1985 to 1991. But meanwhile, economic survey has given some important information with respect to nationalization of some of the sectors. First one is in the year 1953, this is very, very important, 1953, with an Air Corporation Act, with an Air Corporation Act, Air Corporation Act, we have nationalized the civil aviation. We have nationalized the civil aviation. At that point of time, nine air services are working in our country in private sector. We have nationalized it completely and those, some of them are Air India, Air Service of India, Airways, Bharati Airways, Kalinga Airlines, Deccan Airways, Himalayan Aviation, like that we have some. And we have completely merged into two different, merged into two different things. One is Indian Airlines, second one is Air Indian International. Indian Airlines, Indian Airlines and second one is Air Indian International. Air Indian International. This is how we have done in the year 1953. Second important thing that the survey has given is the nationalization of life insurance. LIC Act was brought. LIC Act was brought in 1956. 1956. And with this, 154 Indian insurance companies, 16 non Indian insurance companies, 75 provident societies were merged into this LIC. So, that is how the private thing we were merged into a national. That is LIC nationalization 1956 life insurance sector. And after that what we have done is general insurance business that was happened later in 1972. So, first we have nationalized the life insurance later in 1972 we have nationalized the general insurance with the general insurance business act 1972 at that point of time 55 indian general insurers and 52 foreign uh, general insurers were there we merged into uh, the one general insurance and that general insurance is having some more branches that means there are different organizations in the oriental insurance indian insurance united insurance like that next in the year 1969 you know what happened 14 banks nationalized, but one important thing is the decision was taken in 1969. The act is banking companies acquisition and transfer of undertaking act was enacted in 1970. The act was in 1970, just looking into the box, okay, in economic survey. So, banking companies acquisition and transfer of undertaking act 1970, we have nationalized the 14 banks and again we have nationalized the 6 more banks in the 19. 80. And 1971 to 1975, 1971 to 1975, we have nationalized, we have nationalized the coal mines. Earlier coal mines were under 
earlier coal mines were under private, but we have nationalized it. We have nationalized in 1971 to 75. So, this is some history they have given and ultimately in the year 1991, you know what happened? We have completely opened the economy in majority of the sectors, in majority of the sectors. We have started the process of liberalization. We have started the process of liberalization. Okay. But from the 1991 and again if you looking into the years of 1999 to 2004 with a faster pace, this process of privatization has started. We have used the word initially in the year 1991, bundling of shares and even we use the term called disinvestment, disinvestment and there was a department called department of disinvestment, department of disinvestment was started by Vajpayee in the year 1999. In the year 2001, it has become the ministry of disinvestment, ministry of disinvestment in the year 2001 and almost 12 PSUs, 12 major PSUs were uh, privatized at that point of time, Maruti Ujjog Limited, Hindustan Zinc Limited, like there are many companies. Again from 2004 to 2004 to 2014 also, we have followed the same path, but the pace at which we have done is low, but otherwise we have followed or we have continued the same path of this privatization or the uh, reducing the stake in the public sector undertakings. But after 2014, after 2014, again we have followed the same path, but with a much more vigor, we have started disinvesting lot of companies and also we have started listing. So, listing and disinvestment is not same, disinvestment is in the sense selling to a particular person but disinvest means you just uh, disinvest means selling to a particular person but listing means you just list it in the stock market and an armor person like you and me also can you and me also can purchase but in listing government will lose its stake but every anyone can get the stake but whereas in disinvestment the last stake will be taken over by person or group of persons so lic not what we are going to do is listing not disinvesting okay listing means it will be list and anyone can sell, you and me can be an owner, it cannot be go to a particular person. Okay? So, that is what we have done, but last year uh, during the pandemic, we have announced an Atma Nirbharata package. Under Atma Nirbharata package, what we have done is, we have unveiled a new privatization policy under that four different sectors, because you are already aware, you are already aware, like transport, telecom, space, defense, banking, insurance, coal, power, like these are some of the sectors under the broad category of four has categorized into strategic sector. In this strategic sector only, government will have a bare minimum presence and apart from these four in remaining things, the government have no business in that and it will be privatized completely. That is what the government said. And after that, along with this, we have start, again started a new scheme called National Monetization Pipeline because we wanted to monetize some of the assets. And both this monetization pipeline and disinvestment process is taken by Niti Aayog plus Deepam under the ages of Department of Investments and Public Asset Management and Niti Aayog both will take care, but National Asset Monetization Pipeline we have started. We wanted to monetize some of the brownfield assets or the core assets where we can extract some amount of money and you can utilize for the purpose of investment and you are all aware about this national asset monetization pipeline and also the privatization policy of the government of India. And to carry out the monetization of the land, because land is the most important aspect, we wanted to monetize some of the land. And for the monetization of the land and other non-core assets, to monetization of the land and other non-core assets in an efficient and prudent manner in line with the international practice, the government of India has followed an SPV approach. SPV in the sense it is a company, special purpose vehicle. We will start a company and we will put some money into the company. This company will perform that operation so that the accounts of this company is completely detached from the other administrative ministries of the government. It acts like an individual company. But anyhow, this SPV model they have started and under this SPV in pursuance of the budget announcement, a national land monetization corporation, national 
Land Monetization Corporation, NLMC, with an 100 percent stake of the government, they have started, they are going to monetize the land and as well as other non-core assets in an efficient manner. So, this history they have given, just go through this history, very important, you can use this information anywhere. Okay? This is one aspect. Next, there is an another box in the same chapter, they have provided information with respect to, with respect to the state's participation in the capital expenditure, the state's participation in the capital expenditure. Because if you see the state's capital expenditure is also increased. Capital expenditures alone cannot be done by the center because most of the time that capital assets has to be created in the state, not most 100 percent. If you want to lay a road, you have to lay it in the state. And if you just lay the national highway in a particular state, it is not sufficient, it is not sufficient. Suppose I will give an example, this is a one state and this is an another state. Now we have laid a national highway. So, union government will burden this entire national highway. Do you think that industries will just come beside to this national highway? No. Again, they will choose a proper location and they will uh, establish their company. Now, you have to create this road. If you do not create this road, this road, this national highway cannot be utilized to the maximum extent. So, in line with the total development or in line with the total investment uh, fulfillment, the union government has persuaded the state governments to also make some sort of investment in capital expenditure. So, how the states has given uh, that leeway and how the state government, how the union government has encouraged the state government uh, to take up these type of projects, they have given in one box, just look into that. Now, they have given three major steps in some in some way, actually the purpose of this three is union government has provided an extra window for the state to spend more and more. In, in some cases, union government has given complete freedom to the state to spend wherever they want, but they are suggesting to invest it on capital expenditure, but in some of the cases, it comes with some conditionalities, you have to invest only in some sort of capital expenditure. And one is, one, one among these three is enhanced borrowing capacity of the state, enhanced borrowing capacity, we have enhanced borrowing capacity, enhanced borrowing capacity. So, enhanced borrowing capacity means earlier the borrowing capacity of the state was only 3 percentage of the GDP, for some state it is 3.5 and you know that conditions. But anyhow, normally it is 3 for all. Now, we have extended it up to, normally we extended it up to, extended by 2 points, 2 points that means 3 to 5. But this 2 percent cannot be done automatically, they have imposed 4 different reforms, you have to implement that 4 reforms. So, what are that 4 reforms? One nation, one ration card, one nation, one nation, one ration card, this reform you have to brought. If you bring this reform, you can get an extra benefit of 0.5 percent of G respective state GDP. Earlier you have to, you, you have an option to take only to the loans worth of 3 percent, but now you can take up to 0.5 percent. Who are going to pay this loan? It is the state government, central government not going to pay, but central government is providing an opportunity to you that in this time we are ready to provide some sort of leeway to you, you can slip out of your fiscal path, but provided if you follow some reform. This reform is going to help a lot. It will allow the migration of the people, migration of the workers. It will, uh, red, it will reduce the imbalances that is there in the availability of the workers across various states. So, if you do this reform, you will get 0.5 percent window, you can take extra 0.5 percent of your respective state GDPs loan, you have to pay that. Next, second one is ease of doing business, if you take reforms to promote the ease of doing business, you will get a benefit of 0.5 percent. Next, urban local body reforms, if you 
improve the reforms in urban local bodies that means the tax collection property tax are the resource mobilization at the urban local bodies is very low if you really bring some reforms and show the some changes you will be given another window of 0.5 percent to take a loan in the market next one is power sector reforms power sector reforms on this power sector reforms i already mentioned power sector reform means you have to you have to uh, add it the power properly add it the power properly and make sure that whatever the subsidies that you want to give you must give it in dbt format so these are the reforms and if you get you will get another 0.5 percent but one thing is if you implement any of these three you will get another 0.5 percent of the benefit and if you implement 4 and if you want to take 0.5 that is different but even if you implement any 3 you will get another 0.5 percent benefit. So, that is how union government has given some extra uh, has provided some sort of cushion for the state to mobilize extra resources in order to because with this money suppose just assume if a state is having 8 lakh crore of state GDP just assume. 3 percent means only 24,000 crores that they can take and uh, taken as a loan in a particular financial year. But if I extend it up to 2 percent that means I can take extra 16,000 crore, extra 16,000 crore. I can do lot of development with 16,000 crore in a state. Okay. So, likewise if you add to the entire states you will get huge amount of money. So, this is one area where uh, the central government has provided some uh, cushion or some sort of provisions for the state to collect more. Second one is because of this GST loss, because of this GST loss, states are unable to collect more amount of taxes. Now, I have already mentioned it in the GST chapter, GST chapter recently added to your curriculum you are all clearly aware how government has able to sort out this entire GST problem. One is compensation, they have compensated, second one is loan component. So, the union government has taken a back to back loan and they have given to the states and with that almost more than 1 lakh crore is distributed to the state. That is the reason why if you are able to see in the pandemic year, the revenues of the state government they have not reduced. Because to that 14 percent of growth rate what we have calculated in GST that is something given to the state. But when it comes to the devolution as at the national level some of the taxes collected are less corporation tax like income tax and some of the taxes that is the reason why it has reduced to some extent. But whereas GST collections are concerned they, uh, they got complete refund, refund they got because of this loan component. So, in that way also they got some money more than 1 lakh crore has given to the states by the union government. It is a loan component we have to repay you know how to repay and all that mechanism by extending the compensation such period. Next one is they have started an another program called scheme for special assistance to the states scheme for scheme for special assistance special assistance to states, scheme for special assistance to states for capex, for capex, scheme for special assistance to states for capex. For the capital expenditure, special assistance will be given to the states, it is an interest free long term loan, interest free long term loan that means in within uh, 50 years actually it is 50 year loan period in 50 year you can pay no interest on this no interest on this so this is one scheme and again it has divided it into three one two three either they have come up with some conditionalities they have come up with some conditionalities so if you disinvest or if you monetize your assets you will get some benefit and there are some specific specific northeastern states they will get some benefit from this and there are other states likewise we have divided into three around 15000 crore we have spent last year an interest free loan from state to the from the cent from the union to the state 
for the creation of capital assets. This year in the budget, this 15,000 is extended to 1 lakh crore for creation of capex. Creation of capex. So, just understand these measures and remember these measures you will use somewhere in an appropriate manner. Okay? This is one more thing that they have mentioned. Next, the same chapter has dealt about one important aspect. That important aspect is policy measures to enhance the efficiency of government spending. Policy measures to enhance to enhance the efficiency of the efficiency of government spending. Policy measures to enhance the efficiency of government spending. But here they have given a detailed analysis on only one aspect. That aspect is this uh, government e marketplace. We call it as GEM. Government e marketplace. That means the governmental departments, governmental departments which want to procure anything. Earlier they used to procure in a decentralized manner, in a different manner, but in the year 2016 we have brought this GEM platform and we have streamlined that process. We have changed lot of rules and regulations in the year 2000, lot of rules and regulations and it is a simple, transparent, completely digital process for the procurement. And because of this now the governments can directly procure from the MSMEs or from the companies that are available in India. You can quote and what is the best price and at that best price government can procure. And they have given a detailed analysis in the survey they have given in a box format. If you looking into the Amazon or the normal market platform, what is an MRP at what rate you are getting there and at what rate the government is getting at GEM platform. Now, if you observe and if you do that analysis, the anecdotal evidence suggests that the priority to GEM, the government procurement prices were much lower than the prices prevailing in the market. That means, in the market if it is to 207, then in GEM government able to procure at 200, 200 rupees or 190 rupees. They have given an analysis, you can go and see. So, it has improved the efficiency in government spending. So, that government has paid lot of amount of money. Likewise, they have brought lot of reforms, but in the survey, they have explained only one aspect like GM uh, portal. Now, you can uh, go and you can read whatever the reforms they have brought. Okay, New guidelines for procurement they have brought, just have an idea on this have an idea on this. If at all you want to write anything about efficiency in government spending, you can quote an example like as they are mentioned in economic, economic survey, the GEM portal has uh, benefited a lot. It has reduced the spending by the government and improved the efficiency, efficiency of government spending. This is one aspect. And apart from this, there are other important aspects that the survey is mentioning about the various tax administrative processes. That means, the process reforms we have started because process reform was a separate chapter mentioned in the last year survey. But anyhow, under the process reforms, we have brought lot of reforms in the tax administration, tax administration. And so, they have mentioned about various reforms in the tax administration. If you take the case of income tax, let it be filing of returns, refund time and even the faceless appeal, mm, faceless litigation solving, they have mentioned about that. And even to the customs, for the customs tax also, this income tax, they have brought some reforms. For the customs, the customs, the customs clearance the customs clearance time has reduced and they have eased the process of the custom clearances. And even when it comes to the GST, the GST returns filing, the GST returns filing has reduced and the GST process has streamlined. streamlined. And even if you are looking into the excise tax also, we have brought some reforms. We have reduced the excess duty on both petrol and diesel. And one more important reform that they have brought is very, very important. They have increased this TDS and TCS, 
in order to widen the tax base. So, what is this TDS and TCS tax deduction at the source, tax collection at the source? In some of the professions are in some of the trades are in some of the business activity when you are generating the revenue or when you are making a profit or when you are making the revenue itself you need to pay some tax you need to pay some tax so that your transaction will be traced at the end of the financial year at the end of the financial year if your income is really comes within the tax net then you have to pay otherwise you can get that amount back so, this widening of TDS and TCS will help us to increase the widening the tax base because just now you have seen uh, in, the, in the other part of the lecture the tax to GDP ratio is very low in our country. So, one of the mechanism to increase the tax base in our country is increasing TDS and TCS wherever it is possible and you just try to collect TDS and TCS and so that you can track the transaction and at the end of the financial year if he is really comes under the tax liability then he will pay otherwise he can get a refund. So, these are some of the reforms mentioned in the tax administration process and because of these reforms simultaneously what we have done at the state level at the GM portal level and even at the privatization or disinvestment level and process reform level or PIL level and the agile approach what you have followed and because of this cumulative effect, because of this cumulative effect we are able to contain the effect of pandemic and we have managed our finances prudentially and also now we are going in the path of development or we are going in the path of, path of growth. So, this is something about the fiscal development and the prudent fiscal development during the years of pandemic and just have an overall idea and make note of some important points and whenever you will get in terms of question or something then you can use this information. Lot of statistical analysis I have given and also some of the information that were mentioned in the boxes I have given, some of the reforms I have given and the philosophy behind this government as far as managing pandemic is concerned that aspect also I have given. Okay? So, this is something about the fiscal development. Okay? Thank you. Amrita, IAS Academy.